This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Welcome, everyone, to Somewhere in the Skies, and welcome, UFO people. We are going to be talking all about this brand new comic series from the two gentlemen you see on our screen right now, or their voices you're about to hear if you're just listening to the podcast. So we have with us today Todd Purse and Rob Christofferson. Guys, how's it going? Going good. It's uh, it's it's been a day. It's been a day, but we're we're getting through. <laughs> we're getting through. We were talking yeah. off air before we started here, guys. Um, myself and Rob are both under the weather, so um, yep. we're gonna make it through this because you guys came out with a brand new issue of this comic today. Actually, the day we're recording this on March sixteenth, um, and it's just. I love it. I love everything about it. Um, and the fact that we didn't have something like this before astounds me. But I'm so incredibly excited to know that you two are at the helm of this. Um, so let's just get to it. Welcome, UFO people. How did this project come to be? Um, how did you decide which cases to cover? Let's start with that. How did you guys connect, first of all? Yeah, I, I'll handle part of this and let Rob handle the other part. So uh, thanks for having us. This is awesome. I mean, both of you are uh, hosts of my two most long-listened UFO podcasts by far, so it's kind of wild sitting with both y'all and talking. But yeah, I mean, me, me and Rob connected via Instagram and just kind of talking to each other. And Rob would send me these amazing cases that he would have these just like absurd either experiencer uh drawings and cartoons too or these unknown artists that i'd never heard of and there's just so much like amazing uh art revolving around these cases already that i kind of really wanted to throw my hat in the ring and revitalizing some of these stories and and i i don't even remember who asked who but me and rob just kind of decided to start picking out some cases which i left completely up to rob so i'll let him speak to how the cases are selected and then uh yeah i just kind of he sends me a script and i get to do my thing over the first part of the month and it's been beautiful Awesome. Yeah, Rob, how did uh how did you decide which cases you'd cover in this thing? Which which of these you'd bring to life? So, when I a lot of the time when I'm looking at, you know, cases for the comic, I think of like um, you know, the cases that I covered and like what would really make stunning visuals for a lot of these things. And in in some cases, there are no sketches at all associated with them, uh, like in our second issue on the uh, Dan Duggleby encounter. But like um, a lot of it just came from covering cases on Our Strange Skies and, and just thinking, wow, this would be amazing if it had this kind of second life as a comic. Uh, and pe more people were exposed to these, you know, wild looking cases that are really the high strangeness, the high strange of the high strangeness. Like they are the weirdest cases that I can find. And uh, pretty much every single one of them I've covered on the podcast. Uh, there's one that I covered in a bonus episode, um, but every single one I've, I've covered so far. So within the course of doing a lot of the research, I'll think of something type out a script it usually take me you know like an hour or two and then uh send it on over to todd in this uh, google uh doc folder that we uh share and he takes it from there and and turns it into the magic that uh <laughs> you all see now <laughs> spins it into gold i know i know um well todd i gotta ask you man um in terms of art and whatnot for these things um what are some of your favorite comics that kind of inspired the style yeah. for this? I love the like the aesthetic of it. it it's got like that really 60s, 70s contact -y yeah. feel to it. But um, yeah, are there any like big inspirations for how you decided to approach this artistically? Totally. So I, I really wanted to do it in a, in a little bit of a different style than I normally work in with like my daily drawings or my daily cartoons. I wanted to keep 
the kind of whimsy and fun that I have in the drawings like that I aspire to have, I should say. And I wanted to combine it with that more traditional like 50s, 60s comic style that a lot of the artwork that inspired me uh, that Rob shared with me from the different UFO journals and these uh, different zines from the 70s and stuff. But as far as specific comics, uh, the EC stuff from the 50s and 60s has always been my favorite from Wallywood to Jack Dave to these guys that have some of the most expressive lines and visually i'm i'm not able to recreate those styles as much as i'd like to but uh i i like to try and take what they do as far as movement and kind of bringing all these each thing to life in a different way and really approach these things with a bit of fun to it and having just having fun with the whole thing so yeah i think that 50 60s really uh beginning of the sci-fi comics era is where i've really kind of dug into for inspirations nice yeah and you could definitely feel it in this first uh this first one that we're looking at and guys if you're just listening to this episode i would highly suggest watching the youtube version because we have all the visuals from welcome ufo people up here tonight we're going to be referencing it so this is definitely a youtube version um for those who usually listen so head on over to youtube and watch this right now um well i guess my next question is um how I, rob how do you decide you know these cases are so complex sometimes there's so much to them and like i know for you and me when we try to cover these things it could take hours to try to get through an entire mm -hmm. case but here you guys are doing one page for each of these um easily yep. digestible for someone who just wants like kind of the cliff notes version i guess is kind of how i looked at it but um mm -hmm. how do you decide what you want to actually be included in each of these without you know unfortunately sacrificing a lot of stuff i would imagine it's hard and i see it as a challenge every single time stepping up and saying we've got five panels to make this happen how can we tell this story in five panels that makes it compelling and tells uh, a complete story and uh you know there are a lot of cases that i think of in my head that uh i want to do that are are tough uh like the herbert Shermer uh, account i it's tough to do that because there's so much to it uh, and it's such a wonderful story that when you cut things out, it just, it loses some of its muster, but like with the, with the space pancakes and Joe Simonton, it's a short compact story. That's easy enough to tell in which, you know, Joe Simonton, he's about to sit down to breakfast. Here's a sound outside. sees a UFO goes outside and there's a an opening and he sees a guy and he's got a jug and he's looking for water. And inside, you know, Joe sees that uh, there's just another guy in there and he's grilling something on, on some like smokeless grill. So, you know, he uh, he goes, he, he fetches the water and he comes back and he's basically asks, hey, can I have some? You know, he like gestures to him. So, uh, you know, like we really were able to distill it down into the basic elements. But a lot of the time, uh, if I can find a story that... Um, if you can like take a portion of it out of it uh, and, and really adapt it into something that gets across the point uh, that's what I try to do. And uh, so far we we've been able to do that. Uh, the It's just, I, I will run through my head and say, well, you know, what, what's, what have I covered that will make a good comic? What, what can we do? That's brief. And every, every single one of them, I think we've uh, we've done, a good job of telling a complete enough story to where uh, anybody who wants to check these out, they're, they're not going to be lost there. And, you know, they may even want to go and track down some of the sources that, um, uh, you know, these were pulled from. And like one of the big things uh, that attracts me to the stories that I put in there are all the sketches that I find. And uh, a lot of them are just like absolutely fantastic. Uh, and like uh, just thinking like, how would Todd do this? And I'll take that image, I'll put it in the dock and I just can't wait to see how Todd's going to do it. And like every single comic has been that way so far. And, and every single one has, has just been fantastic. 
Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I love. You could tell you guys work well together because it just it comes together so easily. There's some comics that you see where you can just tell there's some sort of there's something there's a wall between the writer and the artist, and they just don't mm -hmm. seem to mesh. But this just comes together so well. And I know we showed the um, the Simonton one. Let me get this back in on the screen here. This is one of my all-time favorite cases um you oh, covered yeah. most of it rob uh so we'll leave we'll leave that up for the listeners to continue researching the uh mm -hmm. the simon to case because it's one of my personal favorites but um yeah. i do want to kind of just run through all of these with you guys if that's cool um Absolutely. and then yeah yeah so let, let's move to this one right here this one happened in the um the canary islands in spain i believe is this yep. the 1976 one um would yes. you guys mind uh telling us a little about this case and uh maybe why you decided to cover this one so for me the biggest visual that you see on there is that bubble with the aliens inside of it and that is uh, verbatim uh, a piece of art that exists on the internet that is associated with this case. So uh, I covered this case uh, probably back in September, August, somewhere around there. And it's such a fascinating case because it involves the military. Uh, the military sees a light over the Canary Islands. It's uh, over by a different, uh, there's like a battleship over by a different island and they just watch this thing. And they believe at first that it is like a submarine shooting, you know, missiles into the air or something like that. And then you find out there's another portion of this story. And the story involves a professor and another passenger in a taxi cab. And they get close to this thing. Uh, like they get a really good view, probably less than 100 feet away from it. And they see this giant bubble and they see these giant humanoids inside. Everything is large inside that craft and uh they eventually everybody including the taxi cab driver they all flee to a neighbor's house and they just watch this thing depart and like the story is so like it's terrifying but it is also like captivating and like the visual aesthetics like it just uh because the visual aesthetics are so like arresting like it just made for the perfect comic this is this is one of my favorites Nice. Todd, what about uh, where where does this one lay in your your pantheon so far of well yeah. UFO people? This is one that I didn't really know much about at all until Rob sent me the script. And what I do when Rob sends me those scripts is I scroll straight down to the last page where he usually includes the witness sketches or anything that is like a little reference for me. And when I see that, that's usually what I start with. When I see the reference point and they're just so... I love um, aesthetic patterns and there are so many aesthetic patterns that I can kind of pinpoint already from things starting out as lo colorful lights in the sky and then transforming to more of these physical crafts and like bubbles seem to be one of these aesthetic patterns that I'm really digging and this was a great way to like really personify that and when Rob sends me these scripts I love how He's broken down these encounters so that when you read the panel descriptions, it's just, you can picture it so clearly in your mind. And that's why I, I spend a little bit more time kind of doing the page layout than even the rendering of the actual artwork. So I really want it to kind of flow in that way that he's broken, broken down the page, but still have a little bit more uh, interest to it all because it is a really short contained story so i want it to be visually interesting but i want it to read really well so that's kind of the technical side that i think of and this one was really hard for that like this one was one like i i don't draw battleships or like military <laughs> stuff like i don't that's not like my <laughs> my daily so like getting those things down was really fun and it also made this story stick in my brain more because of how much work that stuff put into it but like getting to the part where i get to do the bubble craft and the entities is almost like the icing on the cake like i that's that, i save that i start with the sketch of that but i save the finished part for the end because it's my favorite and it's just so much fun to get really weird with it and I'm, i try to make sure all of these are um 
not portrayed in like a scary way or a way that has a lot of fear associated with them. I've been very conscious of trying to present some of these different cases and paranormal ideas and things in a more positive light because I think there's a, a benefit in the long term of doing that. And I like kind of adding that into the mythology of these things that we're covering. Absolutely. Like, you know, I, I can't imagine doing a welcome UFO people of like Whitley Strieber. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, once you get into like the 80s and 90s, you're getting yeah. into that really scary alien abduction um, time yeah. period. But I think, again, since you guys are really, really kind of right now, at least in the contactee era and mm. the, the humanoid era, um, it does lend itself well, I think, to that idea of it not being scary and it being yeah. weird a f and just <laughs> mm -hmm. fun and fun like yeah it, I, that's what i love about these cases totally Sorry, Tom, go ahead no I was going to say Whitley's a great person to bring up in that regard because one of my favorite things that he's said is that if he had better science fiction growing up, a more positive version of science fiction, he doesn't think his experiences would have been as scary and as frightening as they are. And I think there's some real truth to that. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Kripal cites that all the time. I believe it was in his book Supernatural that he did with Whitley. And I love that because I think about that with my kids. I'm trying to present them these ideas and these uh, parents normal ufos all of these things that they are encountering in pop culture i'm trying to make sure that they're encountering the curious side of it the side that makes you go oh man we live in a really like magical wonderful world that can enrich your life not the side of it that i was kind of brought up on where it's all scary or it's like ghostbusters where you have to hunt the other and it's all antagonistic I, i'm trying to find a middle ground here where you know fear is a part of this and just like the definition of all it, it contains fear like all is inspiration and wonder with a part of fear so i think fear is a fine element of all of this but taking away that antagonistic kind of uh you know hunting and being initially afraid of something that's different and approaching it with a curiosity and kind of a wow stuff's really magical and weird <laughs> oh, yeah man i mean so far we've got aliens with pancakes and we've got Bubble craft. Rob, only you could find a UFO that was just a straight up bubble. I, I knew yeah, right? I know you I knew you could do it. Um all right. <laughs> well, let's move from one island to another. Uh Keats Island, British Columbia. This is another really interesting one that I actually had never heard of. Um Rob, when did this case first come on your radar? And yeah, tell us a little about this one if you don't mind. Back in October, um I had done this deep dive into Canadian UFO report, which is fast become like my favorite UFO journal because it's, it's very down homey kind of like uh, very rustic in the way that it approaches investigation in these cases. Like oftentimes they include photos of the witnesses, which you don't get in a lot of UFO journals. So right. um, there was this story from this woman named Bernice Niblett and it's rare in UFO journals when they devote page space specifically to witnesses. I've only ever seen it one other time. Like if the witness wasn't a, a UFO investigator or anything like that. And then uh, the other case is uh, Miriam Starr. She was given uh, some space and flying saucer review. She, um, she saw the uh, old Saybrook blockheads, which is mm. uh, this very strange case from 1957 in which uh, uh, Mary Starr, she uh, saw this weird UFO outside her bedroom window. And she also saw these, um, weird beings on board and like uh they, they look kind of like a cross between like a dalek with a uh, square head on it with a red kind of orb in the middle of it. it it's a very strange case but uh with, with bernice's case i think what was so interesting about it and, and covered it on the podcast is that it was so very personal to her like uh everything that she was seeing, she basically moved to Keats Island and she winterized this cabin that uh, she had moved into. And before long, she started having these close encounters like on a weekly basis almost. And like, these are strange crafts. Uh, one of them is a barrel shaped kind of craft. And 
uh, there's um, there's a caption like the the center image that you see of Bernice looking up at that barrel shaped object is taken right from Canadian UFO report. Todd put his spin on it, but uh, the caption for that particular image said that the UFO sounded like it was laughing. So it's like, okay, this, this this is just like very, very weird. But she had like a lot of different sightings and like these things were very interactive with her. And the only thing that you're not getting in this comic is that there are like men in black type of encounters that she has with um, hydro men, these kind of like uh, electrical workers that, uh, you know, inspect the lines and stuff like that. Um, it didn't really uh, detract from anything because it's kind of... Uh, it's kind of, it's strange in her account but like what you get right there is like the bulk of her like story and, it, and it's it's absolutely fantastic i love it um could you maybe run us through that last panel there i this i found really interesting you don't the only case that i really can think of that would connect or correlate to this is ray hernandez you know, the guy who's come up right. with like these protocols and whatnot, he recalls having like this orb in his actual home, which you don't right. hear about often. Um, so apparently this happened to her as well. Yes. Yeah, it did. Uh, she uh, she was basically sitting kind of bundled up uh, in the uh, cabin and she saw this orb kind of move into the room, kind of fly around, move around the kitchen, and then it just kind of exited out. And uh, she at one point moved her bed like right in front of the window to like keep an eye on these things. Like she she was interested, but she was terrified at the same time. Like uh, it's it's interesting how she like boils down things into this human perspective that uh, you know I can only imagine a woman who is largely alone on this island like. Keats Island is not very populated. I think there's like 80 people that live there now. And there is, uh, I think like a Baptist camp or something like that on there. But, uh, I, like it's, it's just the weird, the weirdest of the weird, like in, in this small area, this like hot spot that, that just has this myriad of activity that, that she sees. But yeah, like that, that's probably the strangest part of the entire thing is just this, she documents this one orb of light that just comes into the cabin and then uh, eventually leaves. Man, can you imagine like being one of 80 people on uh, an island and all this <laughs> mm -hmm. starts happening? Like talk about yeah. words spreading fast. They probably <laughs> they probably wanted yeah. her off that island ASAP, <laughs> either either because yep. she was crazy or it was about to become like a tourist attraction. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like she was very um she would try to engage people with it and they just kind of dismiss her like oh it's nothing don't even worry about it it's it's not even it, it's nothing worth worrying about so like she kept going through this over and over again talking to police who had uh boats in the harbor like patrolling and like they just would not take her seriously there was one that made an offhand comment it's like oh yeah it's nothing new it just happens all the time <laughs> Yep, sounds about right. Typical, yep. typical Keats Island BS <laughs> yeah. as usual. Um, well, Todd, I gotta ask you, man. Like Rob yeah. mentioned, you know, there's often sketches of like the craft or or even the witness. Sometimes there's a photo or whatnot. But like, what is uh, what is it like interpreting these craft? Because like in the UFO world, uh, witness testimony, like their description of a craft is like Bible. You you mm -hmm. you want to you want to like stick with that as, as much as possible, but also as an artist, like you have to make it compelling. You have to make it aesthetically pleasing. You've got to kind of give it your own spin. What, what is that challenge? Like when it comes to like a witness saying it was this big, this, that, this, that, um, yes. how do you, how do you tackle something like that? So I, I try to stay pretty true in, like Rob said, if you looked at the image that the main image on this page, the one that came from the Canadian UFO journal, like compositionally structurally it's pretty dead on like i i try and stay pretty true to what is offered in those journals because i think there is something special to those drawings like it is like a, a big source of the inspiration and when i saw how much i love the connection between creativity and the weird whether it's ufos or paranormal any of it i think there's a huge uh thread that 
connects the two. And when I saw how many of these people that experience these things are inspired to recreate the thing visually or how much the aesthetics play into their experience, it made it inspired me to keep it pretty true to what they're putting out there because i think that's important so really the biggest thing i try to do is i try to change up the color palette to make it a little bit more fun and a little bit more imaginative and uh, uh, loosen up the reality of it all i feel like if i can kind of loosen up the color palette and make it so that there's a little bit more of a dreamy feel to the whole thing. It makes a reality for these things to exist in a little better, if that makes sense. But yeah, yeah in general, I try to stay pretty true to what they're creating. And this one was another one that I had never heard of before until Rob sent it to me. And the island thing is super interesting. I definitely think there's something to isolation and these events. I know, uh, Rob, not to uh, maybe a spoiler alert here, but I know Rob's been looking into Jeff the Mongoose, which is another one of my favorite island mm -hmm. uh, weirdness things things island of man is that right rob yeah Isle of man so, Isle of man yeah so i love that there's like these little consistencies that go through these cases as we as we keep moving through them yep something with the water i'm telling you too there's <laughs> something there absolutely something there all right guys let's move on to probably the man with the best last name i have ever heard in my entire <laughs> life dan duggleby uh yeah. What's going on here? Uh, Rob, give it to us, man. What, what is this case? I've never heard of this one. So uh, one of the resources that I like to use when digging up kind of um, humanoid encounters is uh, the humanoid catalog that uh, David Webb, Ted Blocher, um, they kind of compiled it. And um, it's uh, contained on QFOS's website. And when you open them up, there are these long PDF documents and they look like pictures of basically like index cards. So I opened up the one for, I think this was 1965 because I was looking for supplementary material for uh, a series I did on all the weird stuff that happened in uh, the United States in 65 to 67. And this case just kind of stuck out uh, well, for one. It, it said that it came from FBI files. Okay um right. that's just absolutely weird Two, that name dan double does stick out but like dude's out in bozeman montana hunting and he hears a weird sound looks over and he sees this like rocket sitting on the ground this tall rocket and these robots get out they've got four arms they're uh going around collecting samples and i'm like it's a crime that nobody has ever illustrated this. I'm like, it, 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 I, that was the one thing that I thought of like, nobody knows about this case. I think it'd be like for a, a great welcome UFO people. So I wrote out the script. This is, uh, this is the second installment of the comic. And I knew Todd would put his like, just absolute perfect spin on it because like, you know, it, all of these robots are happy. They're collecting flowers and air and like so many samples. And then you got a supervisor in the back who's just like happy with all the progress and stuff like that. And like, this is like the perfect amalgamation of what we do and like, uh, you know, finding these like really odd cases that I know Todd it's right up Todd's alley and that he can like turn into and make uniquely his. And that's and that's what he did with this. And that's it, it's one of my favorites. It's so warm. Like when I when I mm -hmm. looked at this one, it just immediately my heart felt fuzzy, especially the last <laughs> panel oh. there. Um, Todd, yeah, man. Like, what what does this one mean to you? I think this really this... like is a representation of that that kind of emotion, that positive emotional yeah. impact you were going for. Absolutely. This one was a bit different. Again, never heard of it until Rob sent it to me. And since it didn't really have any visuals with it, I could really kind of lean into doing it and like go whole hog with the wonder and the whimsy and the and really have fun with it. And what I, I, I do love to share this stuff, like I work on this stuff. I have two kids and I'm on the couch drawing with them a lot of the times on this stuff because this is the stuff I do after the 
stuff I get paid to draw. So I'm, I'm doing it like around the family a lot. And I never want to have something that I've been like, no, don't look at this. Or like, you know, so I'm constantly showing my kids what I'm working on. And this was one of those ones that like, as soon as I finished the bottom panel, my six year old came running over. I was like, what is that? Like, I want this. And he's really into robots and space right now. And he's a very, it's, he's a huge source of inspiration and weirdness for me. But uh, yeah, this one was the one that helps solidify that whole idea that I've been working on as far as how to present a uh, kind of positive pri uh, paranormal primer to my kids. And like, it's really, it was I, like Rob said, the second one and kind of solidified that that's a big part of what I want to do with these and what Rob's uh, offering me by finding these like just kind of cases that mix that absurdity with that, like, uh, you know, physicality. That's my favorite part of all these too. It's like, you know, I definitely love the idea of a lot of this stuff having a psychic link and being something self-reflective about the experiencer and things like that. But I also don't discount the physical elements of these things. And something like this combines those two in the perfect way for me, where you get to draw, you know, silly little robots collecting flowers because they need to collect pretty flowers. <laughs> right. Well, and, you know, that goes back to the whole idea of, you know, these aliens or, or robots, uh, sampling things. I know Rob, you, you, you're a big fan of the case in it's in New York, right? Where the, the New, aliens New were Jersey. taking soil samples, New Jersey, okay. New Jersey, North Bergen, New Jersey. Yeah. The, um, the Stonehenge incident, which, uh, is, is, is going to come up. I think it's next month's, uh, yeah, at this I point, that I, sounds I wrote, familiar, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, all these, you know, George Obarski driving home from, uh, his job, uh, he worked, uh, he co-owned a liquor store and he was cutting through North Hudson park, which I think, uh, uh, I think it's called the James J Braddock, um, North Hudson park now, but, um, cuts through and he's paced by a ufo and ufo kind of pulls ahead of him and it stops in this field and he watches as these 10 beings get out and start collecting soil samples and yeah there are a lot of similarities and i'm like uh there's no way that we're not doing that one <laughs> <laughs> definitely and again it would be a crime if he didn't um right ah Duggleby, i love this this one really <laughs> really uh warmed my heart on a frigid day in scotland um <laughs> to this one guys this one's a little uh not scary but we're definitely getting into more close encounter really close encounter impossible abduction um mm -hmm. territory uh and this is the case of paulo catano i believe 1971 I am i yep. reading that right yeah yeah, yeah. who wants to yeah. this one Paulo, he's uh, he's an interesting guy, and like you kind of got to take what he says with uh, you know a grain of salt. But um, he claims that in 1971 he was just driving home. He was kind of harassed by this UFO, and it followed him for a while until it just like cut off his car in the middle of the road. And it's a tiny UFO; it's not more than a few feet in diameter. Um, and these really short beings, less than a foot tall, get out. And they walk over to his car and they use like um, uh, telekinesis to open his uh, driver's side door. And they escort him inside. Like we're, we're talking like a TARDIS kind of situation here where, you know, he's like somehow inside this object. And one of the most arresting images with this case, when you look it up, um, it's in uh, Flying Saucer Review and one of their special issues. But uh, the, the the center image on the bottom there is lifted directly from the case files. Like there's a bare bones sketch of Paulo standing underneath this light that, um, you know, is above him. And there's this plank and there's this like little being walking across it. And it's like it's one of the most whimsical things that you can see. And I'm like, there's no way that we're not like doing that. So. I included that and I, I love Todd's version of it because he talks about like, I, you know, I was in the space and I was seeing movement and I was seeing color come down at me and eventually he wakes up next to his car um, and he claimed to have further contacts with other beings. Uh, this was a case that I covered. Uh, yeah. Back in like uh, August, I think it was. And, it, and it's just so, it's so strange uh, just because of the proportions of these aliens and this craft and, and stuff like that. It's just so very strange. And uh, yeah, it's just, it made sense for the first 
uh, welcome UFO people because I really wanted to see how Todd was going to do that one image and he knocked it out of the park. <laughs> so uh, this was the first one. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so what was that like? The first one coming together, like where, where you guys, um, what did you think? Did you, were you like, Oh yeah, we got to keep going with this or, uh, this was a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, from my Clearly end, so, yeah, from my end, when I got to get going on this, Rob had already preloaded like three or four scripts at the, off the bat. So mm -hmm. I, this was the first one I really got to dive into. And I'd say like, two panels in i was hooked i was like this is fun and i was still kind of formulating the aesthetic like i had a pretty good idea of what i wanted it to look like from the get-go but you can see the progression uh, even just the previous one with the robots versus this one how i kind of already leaned into more colorful and brighter and less of the and less of the uh the darker tones but the thing that's been consistent is exactly what rob said like i really focus on getting that like uh main image that's provided by these accounts he's finding and kind of putting my own spin on it while staying true and again i'm doing that a lot of the times via color because a lot of the accounts he's sending me are black and white sketches so that's where i can really kind of liven it up and still remain true with what is being experienced and i mean anything with little folk i'm into i mean i, I love uh, i love the the small people that seem to or small beings that seem to pop up in all of these uh stories of the weird for all the cultures forever <laughs> right yeah i mean tracing back to the whole you know magonia sort of feeling and a mm -hmm. lot of this stuff like going back to like the days of the fairies and the fey folk and and you really do see a lot of that in these humanoid cases and whatnot it, it's fascinating and yeah. um yeah yeah this one you you you're right now that i now that i know this was the first one you can definitely see you leaning more into the uh the colorful aspects. Um, and, and that's no more true than with the next one. Now, the Simonton case, the pancake case is one of my favorite UFO cases. But the next one you guys did is by far my favorite welcome UFO people <laughs> with the space penguins. Yes. What the heck is going on here? Rob, what is this case? The Somewhere in the Skies podcast is free to listen to every week. But if you would like to help support the show, we have a very active Patreon page where you give what you think the show is worth. In return, you'll get early access to the main show, bonus episodes, and priority to ask our guests your listener questions. Your support truly makes the show continue and grow. So to learn more and to join, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. So, yeah, Tuscumbia, Missouri, 1967, Claude Edwards, it's, it's Valentine's Day. He heads out like he normally does. It's a cold Valentine's Day in Missouri. And he heads outside and he notices that his, that his cows are all staring in the same direction. So he finds that kind of weird and he looks in the same direction and he sees this. It's a like a mushroom shaped object. And, and I love Todd's interpretation of it, uh, the way that he did it. And... <laughs> Um, he sees that underneath this, there are these green beings just kind of like shuffling around underneath the thing. And like the cows are looking, but they're not really startled. But Claude decides to go over and he's going to start pelting these beings with rocks. But uh, when he does, he finds that there's like a force field or something uh, blocking him. And these beings just like all disappear inside. The object lifts off. But it's, it's one of those like weird whimsical kind of uh encounters from a down-to-earth farmer that uh this is a this is a ted phillips case it's it's one of my favorite ted phillips cases because uh he he uh liked to investigate uh cases with uh, physical traces and stuff and uh he wrote a lot about this case in the uh, mufon ufo journal and flying saucer review and stuff like th this case perpetually kept up for uh, kept coming up for him uh, it wasn't until I think like the last 20 or 30 years that uh, they finally decided to uh, release his name, Claude Edwards. But uh, yeah, this is uh, this is just like whimsical as hell. And, and just, uh, you know, the way I knew Todd was going to put a spin on it with these penguins in it. <laughs> it just turned out so great. 
<laughs> well, and my uh, what I love about this too is the fact that like the first reaction this guy has is to just chuck rocks at it. I, I love <laughs> that. I mean, it makes yeah. perfect sense, right? It's like, yo, are you messing with my bread and butter? My cows are like what I do for a living. <laughs> Like it's my farm, yeah. bro. Little space penguins. What are you doing? Um, yeah, yeah, Todd, give it to us, man. What was it like? Yeah, doing this one? I love that whimsical panel of the cows in space. There, totally. This was one of my favorites and one of the few that I knew before Rob sent it over. I don't know if it was the Kryptonaut dudes that I probably first heard it through. Through, but there was. Uh, I've heard this one before, and it's always been one of my favorites. And I mean, the fact that there's a mushroom shaped UFO and penguins getting out of it, there was just so much fun to be had. I I love the idea and the link with psychedelia and all these experiences. So the fact I that they arrive in a very psychedelic symbol is, was beautiful, and I just thought was the coolest thing. So I really wanted to kind of emphasize that mushroom shape of the uh, the UFO there, and especially I. I like kicking around the idea that, uh, you know, with all the psychedelic images that maybe these beings or entities or whatever you would like to call them are coming here to have their own psychedelic journeys that uh, they are, they're receiving some sort of psychedelic interaction between their relationship with us. And I think this is one of those ones that could totally be a bunch of penguin uh, entities coming here to uh, do a little tripping on the weekend with, uh, with Claude. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. It's just an intergalactic vacation. That, exactly. That's all it is. All it is. Um, it... Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple party penguins. <laughs> <laughs> party penguins. Let's go! I love it. I love it. Well, as of Mar uh, yeah, March 16th today, you guys released a brand new Welcome UFO People. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share that one um that just dropped today uh again another case i've never heard of um <laughs> rob you're so good at this man taurus <laughs> spain 1979 um tell us a little background on this case if you don't mind yeah so uh, this this guy uh was headed to his vineyard uh and along the way he sees this giant egg sitting in the road it looks exactly like ha it looks like half an egg sitting on like three or four legs and he sits there and he watches it he's about to get out of his vehicle and before he does he sees these short little beings and they're running towards this craft and they get in and it, it eventually lifts off but this to me is the the spiritual successor to the space penguins because these just uh, these are space chickens like this, this that's the only <laughs> explanation they're space chickens they look like like i could see this being like some kind of alien chicken just like running towards a craft and you know getting getting back in like their egg craft like and it and it just like it seems so symbolic in many ways um just uh like in the in the presentation of the craft in the in the beings because they I, there's just something about them that just reminds me of chickens so th like it, it it made for the perfect case for todd because i knew he was going to like this just like screams todd like all the way <laughs> so <laughs> and like when i when i pick out a case and i start writing a script because i don't technically know how to do that i had to kind of figure out how to do it and even now i don't do it um, you know, the greatest, but one of the things that I'll do is, uh, I'll picture in my head how I think Todd will do it. And then I'll, um, I'll put my, I'll try and describe it as best I can. I'll, um, you know, there will be, um, the description and then the text to go with it and you go down into the five panels. But, uh, yeah, this, this, uh, a lot of the times, uh, I will pick things that I just want to see what Todd's going to do with them. And, uh, <laughs> he, he knocked this one right out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Todd, anything to add to that man for the, the most recent welcome UFO people? Yeah, the two things that I loved, I mean, okay, the cosmic chicken is great. I think that's a very apt uh, description of this entity. But I also love that the entity almost mirrors the craft, like that big bell <laughs> shape. So this was one of those ones where the entities are really small in the account. And that we kind of have to do like a zoom in panel so you can get that the scale is super tiny, but you can still see kind of what the entity was described to look at. And I just loved that when you zoom in, they kind of 
of uh, mimic the shape of their craft that they arrived in. And I also love that this was a daytime encounter. I have a, a lot of, you know, a lot of these are occurring at night and have kind of more of the evening setting going on. And this one, I got to use a lot of the bright blue skies and really emphasize that, you know, this is a, a big colorful experience going on. And that stark white egg as a kind of contrast of the whole thing. Cool, man. I love it. The chicken and the egg. I couldn't think of a better <laughs> way to um, to kind of wrap up welcome UFO people. However, that's not the only project you guys are doing together. You're also starting another kind of, um, um, what would you call it? Like maybe a companion to this? And you're doing portraits too now, mm -hmm. which is yeah. super, super cool. And you, you started with the one and only George Adamski. So um, tell us a little about the portrait project. What, who are you guys going to be covering and uh, what made you decide to kind of do this as well? A lot of the, the ideas that we have will just start with me sending images to Todd on Instagram. I'll just like spam them with a bunch of images and I'd be like, and, and this was an idea that came up. Like uh, what if we did these portraits with, you know, not only, um, you know, UFO witnesses and the beings that they interact with, but like some of the uh, investigators and some of the weird beings that they've investigated. Like there's there's one that I definitely want us to do at some point, which is Ann Druffel. And Ann Druffel was a, a fantastic investigator. She um, I, she was always objective, uh, although she had a very Catholic bent to the way that she believed in things. But she always presented things objectively. And the thing about Ann Druffel is that she, it didn't matter how weird the cases were. She would, uh, you know, she would investigate them. And like one of the um, strangest is the Palos Verdes brains case, which, uh, you know, is, uh, is, is such a weird case of these two guys who are heading home from a, a friend's house in, in California. And, uh, they turn on their car lights and in the middle of the road, there is this brain. It's just sitting there. And uh, this brain basically tells the driver, Hey, drop your buddy off at home. We're going to abduct you. And they abduct <laughs> him and he's shown a bunch of stuff on board this craft. And uh, his outlook is very, it's very bleak at the end of it, but it, it's just such a weird case investigated by Ann Druffel. So it'd be great to do a portrait with Ann Druffel and all these weird aliens that she investigated. <laughs> oh my God. I almost spit my coffee out when you said, uh, there's just a brain. I'm, I'm thinking of Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Basically, basically yes, that's what it yes, looks like. Exactly. And this like large, it's a large brain. It's like, it's oversized and it has this red light on it. And what he later finds out, uh, the, the, the experiencer in this case is that, the the red light is basically like a tumor because it's old and it's getting close to retirement. <laughs> no, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Wow. wow. That was an emotional Amazing. roller coaster. I know. I know. Right there. <laughs> um, well, and also, I love the fact of like, yo, go drop your loser friend off. We only need one of you to. Abduct. Yeah. We just need you. And, you know, don't like, don't even worry about it. And like, uh, you know, there are other beings that he interacted with, like these like really tall beings with like webbed hands and stuff. It's, it's, a, it's just a very strange case. And like, Ann Druffel investigated a lot of them. She, um, uh, investigated the Harrison Bailey case, which is uh, he was an African American man who uh, is one of the earliest uh, abductees, if you want to call him that. Uh, he was abducted in 1951, and he was abducted by beings that look like large frogs in in many ways, like uh, um, kind of similar to uh, you know your Loveland Frogman in in a way, but like holding these like big sticks and like it'd just be great wow. to to get a portrait of ann Druffel with all of these aliens <laughs> just all the various aliens she's yep. investigating she that's interesting yeah. wow yep. man um well okay so what made you guys want to start with a damn ski here i guess so i think it like it made sense to start with a damn ski because he's kind mm -hmm. of when you think about him, he's kind of the first guy that you go to when you think of alien contact in the United States is that, you know, it's George Adamski. He, you know, interacted with Orthon and, 
you know, a, a bunch of other people and uh, they all looked human. So it, it kind of made sense. Like there are, there are a lot of earlier kind of humanoid cases and like, you know, one of the things that I'm working on right now is outlining a book that I'm writing about a lot of, um, like humanoids throughout the years because they're so interesting. Like, you know, you, there are a lot of strange humanoid cases from the forties that, you know, I found in, uh, up through, you know, the, the two thousands. So, uh, it only made sense to start with George Adamski. Like he seems in many ways, uh, for a lot of people to be like ground zero because, uh, in the United States, it was as if, you know, the, the UFO showed up, but the aliens didn't show up till a little bit later. So George Adamski just made total sense, you know, to start with. Yeah, absolutely. He's like, uh-uh, we're not just talking about the craft. We're we're talking about the pilots in the craft. Mm-hmm. And I mean, what's more iconic than, you know, the Adamski saucer, to be honest? It's just like, uh, again, it just, when I see that image, it just warms my heart. It brings me back to like the early days of when I flipped open my first book on UFOs and saw like an Adamski craft or, or even a Billy Meyer craft mm-hmm. and that was yeah. ufology for me back then and uh, uh god i wish it was still that way now now we've got <laughs> tic tacs and we've got tic tacs yeah flying pizza slices and we've got um and we got orbs we got orbs but um yeah yeah todd i was gonna say what was it like doing this oh this was great i i think uh i really <laughs> resonated when your recent guest uh rpj spoke about how the contact d's get a little uh, poo-pooed too fast these days and i i so i love starting with the damski because i i think there's so much value in the stories of some of these contactees and i love the amalgamation of the culture at that time that the new age movement was really taking off and that this was almost a precursor to the new age movement in a lot of ways and the messages are so similar and like uh, there's so much in there that i think is still very valuable and uh, you can access the uh, life enrichment side of these things through the stories of, that a lot of the contactees bring. And so, yeah, I love starting with Adamski. And I th- I was going to say that I agree with what you just said, Ryan, but it's nice to see like what we're doing here is a way to kind of bring back the fun of it all and bring back the imagination of it. And like the series that you've been doing recently, like your episode with Fred and RPJ and those like those are the things that will make the uh phenomenon or whatever if it really is reflective change and go back to these stories and get away from the military and the tic tac at least in my mind i think stories are way more powerful than any of that other stuff so if we can keep telling these side of the story this side of these stories then uh, i think it will go back to that (laughs) oh thanks man well and i think that's um you know what rob and i have always had in common we find a lot of value in stories while a lot of ufo researchers do not. Um, it, it's not data for them. It's not something they can hold in their hand or, you know, that they can really dissect from a nuts and bolts sort of ufology. And and I think that's why Rob and I connected so early on is we we realized that it's it's a lot more about the stories and the people mm-hmm. telling them. And, and that's Absolutely. what I've always found fascinating. And I think in the last few years, and I do want to get both of your thoughts on this, uh, Ufology has uh, changed uh, for for some people. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of researchers that have completely ignored everything post 2017 ufology, and I greatly respect that. Um, I got caught somewhere in the middle of it, I would say. And um, I think I reached that point where I'm at right now, um, where it's just I want to go back to the reasons that I first got involved in this topic. I, I saw something in the sky I couldn't explain. I sought answers for it. And then I found this entire world that I didn't know was out there. And, and that's stories like this stuff far weirder than just this triangular thing I saw in the sky <laughs> or, you know, this egg that Rob saw. Um, yeah. Not not to, you know, not to say that our sightings weren't uh, life changing because they were for us. <laughs> But um, yeah. yeah, it's stuff like this, stuff like a Damsky, stuff like space penguins, stuff <laughs> like aliens giving you know someone pancakes in exchange for water. Like that's that's what ufology, I think, is. It, it's the absurdist nature of something we'll probably never truly understand, 
And if we try to understand it, that's when, you know, it gets frustrating and, and, and that's when it gets boring. And I yes. think right now in ufology, and I know I'm going off on a diatribe here, I apologize, but um, <laughs> we're finding people, people just want answers and they want them from the United States government. Uh, the people mm -hmm. who they did not trust to give them those answers for 70 plus years, but then now <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden they are the go-to for it. And um I don't know. It's I'm in this weird place in my own personal journey within ufology where like I can have the Navy Tic Tac pilot on one week and then I can have someone on talking about the Swedish men in black the next week. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's what's also beautiful about this. You, you can kind of explore it from all different angles. But for me personally, I think um, it, it just got too bogged down with uh, – with the Tic Tacs and the DODs and the congressional hearings. And, and are we any closer to answers? I would no. argue no. Mm. Um, so why not go back into the case history yeah. like you guys are doing? And maybe we could find some answers there. So, yeah, that was my long-winded way of saying I love you. <laughs> we, <That> was, <laughs> I love what you guys are doing. <laughs> that was beautiful. No, I, I resonate with a lot of that, Ryan. And it's really nice to hear it, to be honest. And, like, there's a the, – one of the things that always surprised me as I got farther into things like this is how far back some of the weirder or the non – physical ideas go like when you uh, start w learning about Carl Jung's work with UFOs and the idea that I feel like it gets mistaken a lot because these types of ideas where it is more of a psychic object that is a co-created phenomenon or how you know Jung never discounted the physical aspect of these encounters the physical aspect and the physical object was part of why these were so special and why they served the purpose of uh, I think Terrence McKenna actually uh, theorized that they serve the purpose of reminding us that we don't know what consciousness is. We don't know what our mind is. And there's no way to solve the UFO phenomenon until we figure out what thinking is. And when you think about how long we've been thinking and still don't know what that is, it's kind of one of those things that like it just keeps going in circles. And it's all just meant to remind you that every day is kind of magical and that the mundane is as magical as you want it to be. And it's just funny that it goes in waves. And I love that there are people like you that sit in the middle, Ryan, because I think there's a lot of value to the physical side, getting more people thinking weirder and the more people that think weird, even if they don't go into the, the deep weird as Dr. Jack Hunter, I still think it's better for everybody. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, man. And, you know, while while some people think fence sitting's not a good thing, I'm going to keep sitting on that fence until my butt can't take it anymore. But, um, <laughs> Rob, something something I've respected always about you, Rob, is, um, you know, ever since 2017, like you stuck to what you first got, like what first got you into doing Our Strange Skies and you never really veered away from that and that's what kept me coming back every week to listen to these incredible stories so i gotta ask you i don't think i've ever really asked you this um on air at least like what what do you make of post 2017 ufology and kind of um what made you not really want to tackle any of that sort of stuff if you don't mind me asking so 2017 felt like a reset, reset switch for a lot of people. I'd been investigating and researching this stuff since 2015. And what I was finding was weird, like just absolutely weird. And then, you know, the New York Times article drops and it becomes this, it, it becomes the face of ufology. And uh, it introduces you to like the future faces of ufology and mainly Lou Elizondo, like, and, and how, uh, he's largely been associated with uh, the UFO movement up to now. And like, if you engage with people online, um, it can be toxic because uh, uh, it just seems like a lot of people put blind faith into um, government agents. And I've never, it's it just to me that, that that's not the interesting aspect of the, the, this topic. And uh, one thing that I always go back to is is your book, Ryan, because I, like 
you asked questions that nobody had really bothered to ask, which is, you know, how did this affect your life? How, what, what happened after this? How did things change for you? And to me, I think that's the most valuable question that's not being asked of these, of these witnesses. And we don't have the ability to go back and ask them because many of them are no longer with us. Like uh, Claude Edwards is no longer with us. Dan Dougalby, no longer with us. Uh, I don't know if Paulo Satano is still with us, but like, we can't ask those questions and nobody really bothered to ask those questions. So when you get bogged down in asking the government to tell us what they know, when the truth of the matter is they probably don't really know that much. You're cutting out the witness in and of itself. Like the witness is the most important aspect of all of this. It's not even the aliens. It's not even the UFOs. It's the witness. Where are they in their life that they're having these encounters? And we don't ask that question. Like that's not something that, you know, uh, comes up in a, in a MUFON. Like, you know, um, uh, when you're filling out a survey, it doesn't come up there. It doesn't come up on, you know, Peter Davenport's site because nobody thinks to ask that question because they're so concerned with the nuts and bolts of it all. And, and one thing that I've really started to gravitate towards is that people see these UFOs and these, these beings when they need to see them in their life. And it affects them in a way that fundamentally changes them and may in fact lead to positive changes in their lives. And, and, and nobody is considering that like nobody's uh, to me, like nobody's really asking, what did you do after this? What did you, how did your life change in the years following this encounter? And like your book was the first, was the first to really put that out there. And like, you know, you, you talk to people who, you know, became pastors who became actors and stuff. And, and that's very important to like, I think it's the most important thing to figuring out what these things are. They are, um, they are these things that show up when people need them to show up and they change their lives. And that is the fundamental, uh, you know, my fundamental belief in UFOs. UFOs are change, change for people, change for um, the better, sometimes change for the worse. And I, I think that's important. And the other aspect of this too is how it inspires us. It inspired us to do this comic. So like, you know, all of these stories inspired us and to me they deserve to have a second life in in many ways and now they're getting their second life in this in this comic and it, it brings me joy every month to to see them when todd's done and he'll like send me a message over on you know instagram and say hey have a look at this uh, let's uh, you know make sure it's good and then you know post it uh, and to me that's at the at the base level that's what we do is like we give a lot of these cases a second life and um you know that brings me just a lot of joy so like to me in in the course of our strange skies and doing this project it's fundamentally changed how i feel about this phenomenon and how i uh you know connect to it so you know like to me that's that's what ufos are they're changed they're changed for people and um yeah, that, that to, to me, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Absolutely, man. Wow. Get me all misty eyed over here. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> that no, that was you make so many good points. And I think, you know, joy, joy, like even if these mm -hmm. things affected someone negatively, at the end of the day, you guys have given it a second life and you've given it um, you've given it a sense of magic. You've given it a sense of of wonder and every time i see a new you know one of your comics drop it brings me joy every time i see a military shot <laughs> ufo still it brings me nothing but just pure <laughs> nausea at this point yeah. so i have to thank you guys i have to thank you for doing this at a time where i think the field desperately needs this they need to feel wonder again um they need to feel uh they need to see the history of this topic, the extremely weird and um, and pro possibly unanswerable side of all of this and realize that um, ufology, at least to me, I don't know about you guys, it's not about finding the answers. Like, I'm never going to mm. know what I saw. 
in, you know, over the St. Lawrence River. You're never going to know what you saw, Rob, up there nope. in upstate New York as well. But at the end of the day, like it's brought us together. It, it's built a community of um, of dreamers, I, I think, to just keep dreaming keep inspiring, keep aspiring, I should say. And I think that's what a lot of this topic does. It really does make us look forward, you know, uh, while also looking back at cases like, like what you guys have done. Um, so no, it's amazing. I can't wait to see what comes next. So let's get there. Let's wrap things up um, to welcome UFO people. What's coming next with the comic? Can you tease a little anything for us? Well, the one thing that I'll go ahead and say is that we are going to have prints really soon. I think this is probably the third time we've made this promise somewhere, but it's <laughs> yeah. it's really going to happen. I swear. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm in I'm in the final stages. Like I said, this is a uh, labor of love that we do kind of on the side yeah. of everything else. So, I mean, the more that we can do it, I I my end goal and i think rob's as well is to have a full print publication of these to have a comic mm -hmm. book of a collection of all these pages where you know you can see that larger narrative and you can identify those kind of patterns and see it all kind of play together because i think these the way that rob's been curating these stories there is like an overall narrative going on that's kind of presenting itself that i think is really interesting awesome. but yeah prints coming soon eventually full book <laughs> amazing yeah. Amazing. Rob, can you tease any upcoming cases you might be covering? Yeah, so uh, we're definitely doing the Stonehenge incident. That is one that uh, I it, it has it has to be done. Like uh, to me that that's a fundamental case that kind of affected me when I covered it on our strange skies so many years ago like uh it, it, it's a short episode it's like 20 minutes long but like it's such an interesting case because it features um you know one witness who sees things close up and then another one that sees things from across the street over at this large apartment building and their times coincide and everything and uh that's just always been an important case for me and um there's a case called uh i called it the shield of light and it's from the year of the humanoids uh in which this um this woman looked out her trailer window and saw what uh she called a a gorilla like being inside a shield of light just like moseying around the parking lot <laughs> so like it's 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 a weird and whimsical case uh and like it, it was another one that i can't wait to see what todd does with it because like the sketches of it are it was leonard stringfield that did the initial sketch but um in in canadian ufo report one of my favorite artists in there is a guy named brian james and brian james uh he um he's done a lot of um these beautiful like full page spread images of certain cases there's uh, one of my favorite my all-time favorite image of his is uh it's a case uh called uh, the rosedale humanoids case and what you see is uh, it, it's beautiful and to me it, it is the equivalent of like starry night but in ufo form it's uh you see this like it's a nighttime scene you, there's these mountains in the background moons out and you see in this kind of like valley um in front of these mountains this like square shaped object with this door open to it and there are two beings inside one of them is right next to a control panel the other one is signaling to a being that is outside collecting like rocks or something like that to get in because there's a woman observing them and it's it's just a beautiful like art piece that i wish i had a, like an original copy of and i could put on my wall it's just so great but um yeah brian james did this one sketch of this gorilla looking like entity like just like tall really just looks like a an anthropomorphic gorilla just like hanging out in the shield of light moving around and uh i i i was just like yeah i gotta i gotta see what todd does with this because it's it's <laughs> it's so good so that that's another one coming down the line i need to start uh getting some more scripts going because these are the last two that i have done but i've got some good ideas i got some good cases done that uh will make for great comics uh, coming down the pipe awesome Awesome, man. I can't wait. Space Gorilla's coming up, guys. Stay That's tuned right. for that. 
<laughs> um, Todd, before we go, man, tell us a little about this project, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, personal folklore is it's kind of my little baby. I uh, a little over a year ago now, I've been working as a full time cartoonist and illustrator for a while. I'm very grateful to be able to do that. And I was feeling a little stuck in certain ways creatively. And I wanted to get back to making zines. It's something that I did growing up that was very special to me to self publish comics and just art zines and stuff. So I uh, gave myself a challenge to publish a monthly zine for a whole year. So I did 12 issues. Well, I did 11 issues of personal folklore. And then I did a, a self published kids book called Sun and Mouse. So those those were my 12 months of publishing one book a month. And this is the first collection of the first seven issues. I picked out my favorite stories, recolored them, added some new artwork and got it professionally printed. All of the monthly issues were printed in my garage, very DIY, just, you know, nice. printed on a Xerox machine and stapled and cut together and everything. Lots of silk screen, little variants and stuff. So I took all of that, all of my favorites from the first seven issue and got it professionally printed, super nice and pretty and got a ton of them for the first time to kind of start the new chapter i maintaining a monthly periodical is not something i can keep up with uh, at this point so i'm going to be going to a quarterly version of it and this is the first uh so they'll be professionally printed they'll be bigger these this one's 48 pages and these comics are they're all like very paranormal and weirdo and ufo related just in a lot less of the way that welcome ufo people is case uh, retellings this is the philosophical the uh, touching on things from what role do psychedelics have to play in the paranormal to what role does death have to play and all the things that i've kind of amalgamated in my brain from reading books and listening to people way smarter than i am over the years and i put them back out in these silly little kind of th uh, five to seven page stories and then there's a big chunk of just single page goblin like funny is like just single page goblin comics where he's doing silly stuff so <laughs> that's kind of my the big thing i'm trying to uh to keep going this year and been really grateful for all the support and yeah i'm real excited to share this one with everybody awesome man goblin funnies i love it yeah. um <laughs> well last question for you todd and i'm probably gonna throw the two images up here but uh both rob and i had the awesome honor of coming on your podcast actually uh creative weirdos can you tell us a little about yeah. that before we go <laughs> totally so creative weirdos is the interview segment of a daily art podcast i do called create magic podcast i do daily drawings and i post them on instagram and then i do a little five to ten minute kind of ramble about what i was drawing and thinking when i was drawing it and i started doing an interview segment to kind of explore this idea of creativity and weirdness and i have two main groups of friends one of them being professional artists and full-time creatives and one of them being people like y'all who ride this boundary of the world of the weird and being full-time creatives and like I wanted to explore that connection more by talking to folks like yourselves and really just having an excuse to reach out to people that really inspire me and all the work that I do and kind of throw some ideas around so yeah I drop a different interview every Saturday and it's been super fun I I've gotten to talk to some people like yourselves that have like very much inspired my work the last couple of years so yeah I definitely hope to keep doing it <laughs> It was super fun, man. Again, got to stretch those uh, theoretical and creative muscles over there. So thank you. Thank no. you for having us. It was great. And thank you. I mean, so one of the coolest things about doing the podcast and kind of putting myself more out in this community is these weird little synchronicities and the, like I, ha I got the chance to have you on Ryan. And from there, Mike Cleland, who is somebody I've always loved his work. He reached out because he heard our episode and was like, I think I would be a great guest on your podcast. And I was like, this is amazing. And it's a long story, but <laughs> essentially, you know, Mike Cleland is known for owls and synchronicities and UFOs. He reached out to me. He texted me on my phone, which was very different. Like I don't usually get text messages <laughs> from random people, right? So he texted me on my phone. 
And I literally just got home from the hospital because my six-year-old had eaten a Lego. He swallowed a Lego, and it was a piece from Hedwig the Owl set from Harry Potter. So my Whoa. son had literally just swallowed a piece of an owl, and then Mike Clellan texted me because he listened to our podcast and asked to be on. And I was like, Mike, you're not going to believe this. First off, yes, 100%. I can't wait to talk to you. And uh, <laughs> this just happened. My son swallowed a piece of an owl. <laughs> so, so Wow. I yeah, I, I couldn't remember if I actually relayed that to you, Ryan. So I figured this would be a good opportunity. So thank you for uh, allowing that, that to happen. <laughs> that uh, you hang out or you talk to Mike Cohen, something weird is bound to happen. Try spending yes. a whole weekend in his Adirondacks cabin. That was a, <laughs> an experience Rob knows well at this point that I've told. But um, yeah, mm. yeah, awesome, <laughs> man. Well, yeah. Rob, obviously, man, before we go. Can you tell us what you might have coming up over at Our Strange Skies? Yeah, so Our Strange Skies, we've been going weekly since uh, late 2021, uh, which was something that I had never done before and uh, somehow managed to keep it going. And yeah, like uh, lately I've been driving into these like narrative episodes uh, and they've been super fun to do because like... Uh, you know, it's it, sometimes it's just fun to sit there uh, at a microphone and, you know, decide how am I going to, you know, uh, dramatize this for the listener. And um, the next couple episodes that we got coming up are great. Uh, uh, next week's episode is on the Coronado group alien abduction, which uh, is very strange. It's kind of the potpourri of abduction cases from the 90s where you have a bunch of different alien beings abducting people that are attending a UFO conference. And it's a very strange case. Uh, we are going to be doing an episode. It's been recorded on the lead masks case. And, you know, we dove very deep into it. Uh, and uh, we came away with, you know, I think what is the kind of best conclusion on that. And uh, yeah, right now we're, we're, um, you're going to hear a little bit about Jeff, the talking mongoose at some point um, very soon uh, with some very special guests on that one. And uh, I'm really excited to share that one because it's, it's, it's a great story. It's a great story about, you know, um, a family that purchased a farm and they had a talking mongoose in their house. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always like, I'm always thinking, always working, always kind of putting out stuff, but uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much what I got coming down the pike right now. Awesome, man. Well, hey, I can't wait. We covered the lead mask case over on Patreon, um, but not as in-depth as I'm sure you went. So I'm really interested to hear this conclusion that you possibly came up with. So I mm. definitely looking forward to that. Um, Rob, where can we find everything you're up to, brother? So uh, the one-stop shop. Uh, for Our Strange Skies uh, is uh, OurStrangeSkies.com you can find links to everything there. Uh, if you want to check out Welcome UFO People we are on Twitter at Welcome UFO Peeps and Instagram at Welcome UFO People and Todd and I both release high res images on our Patreon pages so if you want like the, the really high res high quality images join either one of our Patreons we put them out monthly and uh, yeah if you want to follow along Long on uh, Twitter. I am at your UFO guy, spelled Y E R UFO guy, and uh, the show account is at, at Our Strange Skies. So uh, if you want to keep up with all the weirdness that I got going on, those are the uh, best places to do it. Perfect. Todd, give us the socials, man. Where can we find everything you're up to? Cool. Uh, CreateMagicStudios.com is the best place as far as the shop and Patreon and podcast and everything. Uh, Create Magic Podcast, wherever you listen to it, is that'll get you the interviews and the daily art stuff that I ramble about. And then uh, at Todd DE85, which is a weird one, but that's my Instagram, and that's <laughs> where I keep all of my daily pictures and everything. So if you want to see the stuff that I make every day, that's the best place. Awesome, man. Well, Guys, welcome UFO people. Goodbye, UFO people. <laughs> so, Todd, Rob, I had to do it, guys. I had to get the fun in there. I had to do it. Todd, Rob, thank you so much, guys, for joining me today on Somewhere in the Skies. It was a true honor. Thank, thank you. Man. It was a great to be here. It.